kind of pull you out, you know. She would find herself in a gymnasium, and I, I tell the pastor all the time, he doesn't, he doesn't look like he's, he's going to be 73 in a couple of days. 74, wow, in a couple of days. I hope some of you all are as good as him when he's 79 or 74. I don't have any work to do, bro. <laughs> Coming now, tell us a little bit about this school. It's not just a good friend, Alice. She's going to do it by the way of the tribute as well. She was not a good woman. She was an extraordinary Ease 
more pain. I have not slept a full night in about at least since we came back from our vacation in August. I may have slept two hours a night because I had to lift up her up and take her to the bathroom and to massage her. I had to rub her with different ointments because of the pain that she endured. She loved the Lord more than me. I can tell you that. She would pray and she accepted that God would heal her. She is not where she is because she did not believe God. But God will all things God. When we pray, we pray that Jesus taught us the Sabbath for not my will, but thine be done. Though I might have been selfish and wanted help to be healed, to remain on this side, but God saw fit to take her home. How's that you are? We went to school together. She was eight years old and I was you know, the first time we met. Years went by, she turned 15 and I turned 18. We began to date. We dated until she was 17. And then she and I was 20 to 21. Got married. In 1971, we made a union. Out of that union, God gave me five wonderful children. Thank you. 
Nightingale Gospel Chapel, and also on the corner of Augusta Meadow Street. I also spent some time with my oldest brother, Manuel Paolo. I know he was here. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, everybody.
up until uh, this ability to move around. The first time I went to pay bills was three months ago. I have not paid a bill in about 30 years. My wife paid all the bills before she got all the money. <laughs> I went to the cable company and I ran to see security and he said, Bishop, this is the first time I've seen you in here. I said, yeah, I said, my wife is not very really good. He said, oh, your wife is a baby. I said, yeah, I said, so I'm not right now. And so right now, I do not know what to do. I do not thank God for my kids. I never use a washing machine. I don't know how to operate it. I never use a dryer. I don't know how to operate it. No, I have ever used a dishwasher. I do not know how to operate this machine. <laughs> I am a white fisherman. I pouch eggs. She taught me how to do that. <laughs> other things I want to this is the first time in 28 years we have not had a Thanksgiving dinner. She would make Thanksgiving dinner. She would make two or three turkeys every November. Every type of pie that you can think about. She would make, she start baking four days before the uh, Thanksgiving. Ham, turkey, trimmings, everything. And people came from all over Grand Bahama. People I did not know. And when they came, she said, Oh, this is this one food, this is the other one food. And they would get their food, and then they would leave. People have been walking up to me since then and saying, I do not know this really honestly, but I appreciate our wife and I'll thank you in a better way later. I do not know the people, but my wife knew them. And so they would say, I pray for you, Pastor Richard. It is because of her. I know some of you are here also because of me, but a lot of you are here because of me. There are about three of my former students who brought an entourage with them from Church of the Kings Island. Toriano, one is my son, Ira, and uh, Mr. Adam. Are they here? Yeah. Could you sign for me, please? Yeah. 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 That's my son. That's Toriano. He's a young man. He is a Brother to my daughters, brother to my sons, he lived in my house for I don't know how many years before he graduated and moved back to Texas Island. He is now the, one of the ministers of planning in Texas and Kings Island. <laughs> my wife washes clothes, cooks his food, treated him as a own children. And that's why. Where the Lord says, when you entertain strangers, you entertain angels. And I look at them as angels. Out there, the cave here, there's a woman. I'm going to wait in a minute. There's a lot I can say, time will not permit me. I'll probably tell you in the book later. She was the woman. Love my family. She loved my mom, my sisters. Today, I have how many sisters I have? Today? <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have four, three of the sisters here and three, and three brothers here. Four, 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 four brothers, but no money already start. So the ones that did not start, would you stand for me, please? Um, um, that's the best. That's the best thing. My baby sister is the one, my other sister, my sister, I just feel like that. Let me see you back here. I really love my brother. The reason for that is my wife, my mommy, told me, Alphys, you don't have a knife, you have a wife. I mean, you said, well, I didn't want to do it, I didn't want to do it, I didn't want to do it. 
comes to relationship, my wife established with her in-laws. She was a special individual. As I close, if I could live my life all over again, message preached by Esther Roloff back in the 80s, a Texan minister, he said, I will do it this way. I can live my life all over again. I want Althea, Lita, next yes, season. Yes. No apology. I know that is not possible. But if I could, right. it would be the trouble I want. Amen. But the good thing about this is I shall see her. Jesus said, heaven there is no marriage, a human in marriage. But I will see him as a saint yes, in glory one day. Yeah. And for that reason, I have, yes, my heart is heavy, yes, my heart is broken. And perchance healing will come as we travel in this pilgrimage. But until then, let us be the courage and continue to uh, live and complement her legacy. That's all I can ask of you. And for the most part, what I said of her is the truth yes, sir. and nothing but the truth. <laughs>
trusting in you, Lord, to see me through. That's the only person that we could trust in to get us through situations like this. And so uh, that's where our confidence is. And our confidence is in the Lord. I'm going to ask at this time one of our dear friends uh, uh, from Nassau to come, Brother Milton Johnson. Uh, Brother Milton and uh, Woodside, Pastor Woodside, his family and our family, we vacation together for over 20 plus years. Again, father, you know. For our moms, police force, they really get you. Let me remind you of something, you've got three minutes. <laughs> come get talk longer than that. My boy, you're a police officer. Oh, <laughs> so they're going to follow the instructions. And don't say that to me because I have to write after you. Give him back, give him back. Does Jesus care when I say goodbye to the dearest one on earth to me? When my poor heart aches and a daily breaks, does he care enough for me? And the chorus goes, oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. His heart has touched with my grief. When the days are dreary and the long night weary, I know I say the kids. It was some 39 years ago, Pastor Dave Adams, our new pastor at the time, brought us here at the Tabernacle. They were across the street on a mission trip of about 30 young people. We were all 17, 18. And he spent up in a lot of homes. And the home somehow got out of plan and he put me in the Woodside home. Me and three other young men. So the first time I ever came to Grand Bahama, I stayed with the Woodside. The first time I ever ate a what was from this Woodside. I'm always you to come. <laughs> the other three gentlemen, two o'clock one morning, decided to wake up and go in the fridge while everybody's sleeping. They were trying to post me and all, with me being the obedient person I was. <laughs> and I, the I didn't take that chance. So this Woodside smelled the pot warming. This guy, Don Davis, came up and from his website came out and said, All you have to do is she has quiet, smiles, smiles, and all you have to do is ask if you want more, you know. Yeah. So, of course, when they break here, Pastor Woodside had to meet with us, the four of us. And after the meal was done, she said, Why y'all can't be like Milton? <laughs> and then our friendship grew, and I want to say, We had many vacations together. I'm staying with them. Hit our hand fields, the great. So a lot of folks were now when I talk about this my home. When I was trying to grab my hand wherever I was, I talk about this my home. To make a long story short, I just said we on our vacation cruises, Atlanta, Alvaro, when I thought about Mark, Atlanta, we went to Atlanta, plenty of places. But fast forwarding, God spoke in the tent of November the same month. He said, Well, my mother in law, my father in law, and now so they're going to do an emergency surgery. Shelly and the doctors and Keely is flying now. I said, no problem. So I called Dr. Shanti his daughter. I said, they there yet? He said, yes, I'm coming to the hospital right now. So I came to the hospital, sit down, talk to the man in the room. Sister Woodside was sitting up saying, say, Wilson, everything's in God's hand. She's about to go into the surgery. So I just wanted to hear them go. But seeing that Shanti was getting all the stuff prepared, I said, I'll stay in touch here. He's going to operate in the room. So I stayed there. Two hours gone, nothing happened. Shanti back and forth, Dr. Shanti back and forth. What happened, what happened? They need more blood, what that now? And so we decided to talk about a little bit of family and vacation and we had previous. She had even reminded me of one that I had uh, did before. I'm talking about something that I said that I didn't remember. And so Sister Woods, I was laughing and communicating with us. They, they could tell you all of us there along Pastor Woods' side. And she had a little seizure, of course, the key up, and Pastor Woods' side brought it back. And so Dr. Shanti rushed and told him what's going on. The doctor said, bring her on me. And her last words, and this is very touching to me, her last words was, tell her husband, Alpheus, bring Bill to meet you so he can help you lift me in the bed. And of course, we were in the waiting room, and I did that. I mean, Pastor Wood type, go in there, lift in the bed, we came on there. After a few minutes, of course, wasn't no good news. But I'm glad that I spent those last moments with them. Yeah. Yeah. I know that those have been the last two hours talking and laughing, and she had still way home. Because she was the high spirit, the person coming to me, going to get you now, and all that, just waiting for the blood work. And just like that, she was still away. 
As I sit back, take my seat, I want you to know this woman is a woman of virtue. She is a blessed woman. My oldest daughter, she's here, my whole family's here. My oldest daughter spent summer with them. My son came out and spent summer with them. So it's nothing that we we'll have grandkids high by being that. Same thing on vacation. And you know what? I'm glad that one day, even though she's still away, we're going to see her again. Because yeah. dad's going to come to all of us, like Brother Nora said. Um, the story is full of us, as I said, we see of a 50 year old man having a birthday party. And of course, he invited his friends from the United States, invited his friends from America, uh, Canada, all over the islands, to the Bahamas. Yeah, I'm going to say Canada and USA. <laughs> and, so, and so we had a party that he had, I mean, he invited everybody. I was like a fair. That was a knock on his door. It was dead. Dead showed up. The dad said, man, it's your time, you're the list. So he said, no, dad, you can't do this to me. Please give me one more chance. At least I'll come by So of course, him and dad bargained, and dad agreed with him. So he said, dad, get dad drunk. Dad slumped over on the couch, and before you know it, dad was all over. So he grabbed the book, and he looked, show us the image to talk. So he flipped the page and rubbed it over and put it in the back. After dad woke up about six hours, he said, well, you treat me good. I was coming for you, but I start from the front, and I start from the back. <laughs> it is the universe, you know what I'm saying? You can't drop that. Let's be prepared, be ready. So, on the resurrection morning, we will see our sister, and we'll be right here. That's, that's the spread in all the world. Amen. He robbed me out he robbed me on Friday. I was thinking over to the link that I was viewing. He said, I asked him, go to view it. I said, boy, you think I should be my daddy? <laughs> my best is spread in all the world. If you don't have a friend who tell you when you're right or when you're wrong, you don't have a friend. You don't cut no corners. So what's I didn't cut no corners? You know, I listen to the grandchildren. They take over the house now. No pastor, that's I don't care. They can be on top of the roof. <laughs> so we fridge, drink over every day. So everybody, all of us, all of your own sister one side, all of your own sister one side. <laughs> and so we were talking this morning, my head shot and tell him, say, you all know if Grammy was alive, if none of y'all would have been in that room. And then they take over sister one side of us. And then we wrote it and pastor was like, you say that. <laughs> They're going to break it up. I'm telling you, those children are all over the place. You know what I'm talking about, James? That's how you do your grandchildren. Yeah. Amen. All right. Coming right now is Pastor of uh, Calvary Bible Church. Uh, Pastor Roll is going to come for three minutes and have this say that we're going to invite you to meet her next. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we have my personal family, my wife Jasmine and I, our children, and Calvary Bible Church. This is a great opportunity for us to be able to be here today. Uh, I walked into this church as a 17-year-old young man in 1987. And from then to now, for all of those persons who walked in here in 1987, or even prior to myself, you can testify of the love of Althea Woodside. My family and I, as a young man growing up, I would always hear Sister Woodside come to me and say to me, Darren, stay focused. And as a result of that, I developed a little relationship with our sister Woodside. I also want to take this opportunity to say that there are many young men or men in here from Wendy's where Pastor Woodside also comes sometime and spend some time. So those names are not called. There are several men in here from Wendy's where I also go and spend some time. He comes there and they're here to show their support today. But as a result of that relationship with Sister Woodside, every Christmas for the past several years since she was traveling, I would always find time to be able to put some money inside of her hands. I would always call up her and check up her and find out she's doing well, even prior to even getting sick. So I want to say to Akita, uh, my good personal friend, and I want to say to Shelly, and I want to say to Douglas that I want you to find a young girl that's in your family. She must live in Fruitburg, Run, Bahama, and tell that girl finish his high school. Uh, my family and I will take up that girl's uniform, so every summer, uh, almost somewhere there about, so she needs to pair three, three skirts, three tops, whatever she needs. Uh, we're going to take care of that and then bring her to Woodside. For the funds that I would give her during the Christmas time, we'll take that 
and we will continue to do that for her as far as that is concerned. And then I have a couple books. And I want to say to Pastor Kutsai that I am the man that I am because of the sacrifice that you and your wife made as a pastor of Tabernacle Baptist Church and as the administrator of Tabernacle Baptist Christian Academy. And I want you to know on behalf of all of the young men that can't speak, that grew up from the time that I've been here, and all of the young ladies, that we love you, and we appreciate you, yes, and we're here to support you wherever we can. And on behalf of my wife and our three children, uh, if you all are going away this summer, you're going to take care of your ticket, and we're going to make sure that you have a wonderful time with your family. Right. I want you to know that I love you personally. Thank you for, thank you for the opportunities that you gave me. I am the man that I am. When I walked into this church, my father was not involved in my life. And you became one of the men that became a father to me. And I want yes, to know this afternoon that personally, I love you, and I appreciate you, and thank you for all that you've done helping me to get where I am today. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, for that. And all of the boys, all of the young men that were here in the 80s, you came here in the 80s, all of you that were in the 80s, any of you here, please stand. All of you that were here in the 80s. These uh, 70s and 80s, 70s and 80s, Rob, or whatever, I'm saying, you know, Korea, Korea, you keep signing up. Now, you know, 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 you I promise I'll be here, but anyway, uh, Pastor Beckles, come and uh, bring some remarks, please. Very close friend of Pastor Mitzayda. Good afternoon. As I'm sitting here, listening to what has been said about Sister Woodside, and I mean this, if this was an Old Testament story, we'd be reading it in the Bible. But the thing that saddens me is this, and I say this every opportunity I get, Death is so permanent, it is amazing that it doesn't change us. Death on this side cannot be corrected. And the thing that I want to say to the Woodside family, the whole clan, is that you have memories that millions of families don't have. Because you intentionally took the time to invest in one another. And I say to you, sitting at a bit of an audience this size, if you took death seriously this afternoon, you would go and fix some things. You would go and ensure that first of all, you were, you were in line with the Lord Jesus. Many from most there's a lot of hollering and screaming out of guilt and regret. And I pray that this afternoon, we would all be transformed by a living testimony of how we can rest the body of a loved one in the midst of sorrows, but we have tremendous relationships that, that we can treasure. Someone don't speak to your mom, don't speak to your dad, don't speak to your brother, don't speak to your sister, don't speak to a church brother or sister. Death is too permanent to play around with it. And when a person is dead, you cannot fix anything. So I pray this afternoon that we would follow a living legacy of a testimony that has been so richly shared with us. It's so on behalf of myself and my wife. I shared with Pastor Woodside when I called him I said, listen, I'm not going to quote scripture to you. I've been where you are. I buried a wife before. So I know the pain. But I said to him, cherish the memories. So I pray today that we all would be transformed by the reality of death. And we would leave here and fix the relationships that are broken so that we can all have this type of service without lying. Yeah. Yeah. Without pretending. Without having to fix it up. And so that's my, that's my five cents to say. But I can tell you, the only person that has the power to transform us, to be able to do that in spite of hurt and disappointment, is so much yeah. So, that's the good side of your whole family. Our God is still King. The Holy Spirit is still a comforter. And in the midst of pain, there is healing. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, um, Pastor Beckles, uh, 
those kind words. And now coming, I, was, I watched him spend a couple of minutes with Pastor Woodside yesterday. He came in and just was trying to figure out what he could do. I and mean, you know he just lost a big election in less than a big one. Afternoon, church. Let me first say to Pastor Woodside, I believe I came to Grand Bahama probably about 15 years ago. Tabernacle was one of the places that I spent a lot of time. And I want to say to Shelly, thank you so much for the honor of having this chance on behalf of my wife Burleys, the Marco City family the Free National Movement family, to join in paying tribute to your mother, Pastor Woodside, your wife, to someone who has made a huge difference in this country. Uh, the truth is, a lot of the persons who helped to transform the Bahamas sometimes don't have name, face recognition, right. but they're the glue that hold this country together. And so as we celebrate the life Sister Woodside, the truth is, I'm speaking on behalf of all of the young men and women who passed through Tabernacle. Because it would not have been possible for Pastor Woodside and then Shelly and my good friend Norris and others who lead this institution, have led this institution to, to do the work that they would have done. Most of us men in here who are married, we know that behind every good man is his backside, but on the side of him is a powerful woman. <laughs> and no doubt, no doubt, Sister Woodside played a pivotal role yes. in helping to shape a family, to undergird a man, so that when he walked out, he could walk out with confidence, Amen. never having to hold his head down, because the most important institution in his life, his family was cared for, nurtured, and overseen by a powerful woman. And this Woodside family, you, you continue to make a contribution to our country. And one of the best examples of a life well lived is the fruit that they produce. And the children, their extended family, this, this amazing family has made a world of difference, not just in the Bahamas. But I've had a chance being here in so many ceremonies to watch people travel from around the world to be here at Tabernacle and to sing your praises and to invite you and, and Brother Norris and others to just travel internationally, continuing the work that started here. And so, as I take my seat, I just want to say, Pastor Woodside, our hearts go out to you. Every time I hear you, I came here just recently as you and your wife celebrated decades of marriage. And, and trust me, there are some men in this room if they're here with their wife, the wife was squeezing their hand or groaning as you talked about your wife. It's not possible to hear you and not want to go home and make sure that things are right with the women in our lives. And like Norris, we married above our station. <laughs> I said before, I saw Milton. Milton is a 
Pentecostal preacher of the New Providence. <laughs> but I would say this, I grew up in Yellow Ella Church, in a very poor house. And my mother, Sister Laura Benson, would often say, while she's cooking in that kitchen with five bad children and a wayward husband, she would still be saying, God, I praise you, my good father, just worship you, Lord. And I would be in the hallway hearing my mother on my way to a priceless hell and wondering why is she thanking God given who he has placed in her life. But my mother had the peace that passes all understanding. And it is that peace I commend mainly to the grandchildren and great grandchildren. Because I know, I know the children, you know God. But God has a way that when the calls stop coming and the visits become fewer, he has a way of filling the space that has been left by the passing of Sister Woodside. And God has a way of providing healing. We're designed as human beings to heal in the midst of our pain. So family, I believe it was Solomon uh, that made the point, Solomon 8 and 6, that love is as strong as death. And so even in the passing, the love that you share, the memories created, will sustain you to these difficult times. Yes. So we're praying for you. And the pastor is going to come and minister. One of the things that I always ask when I come to church, particularly to a funeral, is what word God has for me. Because all of us could have been somewhere else, but we're here today, and so many messages have been given. And so church, let's learn to love each other. Now let's talk about uh, the politics they engaged in recently, but, but the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is, we have to turn to each other instead of on each other. We have to love each other despite the color that you do. Nor is we to forget those who despitefully use us. But that's how. Because life is so short, Church, we have to suck every bit of joy we can get out of it. We have to go to the restaurant and read the menu from left to right, worry about the price later. And if you're left and you can handle it, and you go to 8 Mile Walk, drive along the scenic route, suck some salt air, and appreciate the beauty of what God has given us. We love you, family, and we're praying for you. God bless you.
I'm glad I come to the call. Amen. 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 From it and then Sunday. I'm not saying this song in honor of the Lord of God, knowing that this good time is looking down. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to sing with me. Glad I've come to the call. When forever is satisfied.
power and the presence of thy spirit. I pray, God, you'd help me to remove that which is not needful and include that which your power will be exhibited. Your name may be exalted and your name glorified. Lord, save the lost that might be in our midst. Strengthen this family, the Woodside, Father, and all that are here on Sundays. We thank you for the life of Sister Arthur. We're thankful that we knew her. We're thankful that we certainly have the confidence of her being in your presence in heaven with you. May your name be lifted up and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. You may be seated. You perhaps have heard the story of the two friends that were very close. Of course, Pastor Woodside, we have already made a pact. Whoever dies first, the other one buries the other one. We preach. The other two. That's how close we are. We have one more person in that pact, and Carl Nathan also. But we've come to have a kindred spirit, understanding and understanding what others, what we're all about, getting out the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the story is told with these two friends. They love to play baseball together. And as they, uh, when they were having a baseball game, one of them died. Uh, well, he fell down, he was sick, and the other one came to minister to him, and he said, listen, I'm about to go. And uh, the guy, the other friend said, listen, before you go, if you get on the other side, could you please find out if there's any baseball <laughs> in heaven? And so, the fellow died and went to heaven. So he's trying to, another one on earth was trying to figure out, well, how do I get to communicate? But one night he went to sleep. He was dreaming. And finally, his friend came to him in a dream. And he said, I have good news and bad news. He said, what's, 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 what's the good news? Give me that first. He said, there is baseball in heaven. He said, what? He said, well, tell me the bad news. He said, you're up to bat next. <laughs> I don't know who's going to be up to bat next, but somebody's going to be up to bat next. In other words, the Bible says in Hebrews 9, verse 27, it is appointed unto man, and after death, Job said, if a man dies, and live again. So we are at that point in our lives and in our history where we are facing death. And we've been dealing with death, especially as we celebrate this ongoing service of Sister Woodside. A wife, a mother, an aunt, a grandmother, a sister, a friend, etc., etc., etc. Our last time together was a few months ago, or July, somewhere around there when we were all on a, a little tour. And I was speaking in the Caribbean, St. Martin, Sister Woodside, and Woodside had called me, he said, listen, I want to go on that trip, a few guys here, and I'm bringing my wife. We had a blast. We had a great time. And uh, there are times when she was experiencing pain, and then there were times when she got relief from the pain, she was always, every morning, serving breakfast in bed, uh, fierce. Yeah. Oh, no fierce. Yeah. She still was serving breakfast in bed. She said, what a woman. What a celebration. What a vibrant bright, bright spirit she had. She enjoyed herself. She said, Pastor Woodside said, that was her best trip. That was the one she really, she said it was good. I believe she knew she was going to go. I think all the premonitions, all the things, if you talk to the family, I mean, the things which you would have said to Pastor Woodside, you know, well, this, I, you love me that much? You know, that's the day she died. Huh? That's the morning she's saying those things. There's information she left to her grandchildren to tell them, take care of this, you know. And so it, there was some kind of thing that indicated that somehow, you know, Shelly, somehow, doctor, she knew she was going. And she was trying to prepare everybody else. And we were getting messages in, you know, symbolic fashion, not realizing 
and she was going. It is our joy to be here, and I'm going to get this real quick. I want to make sure, let you know how important she has been to us. I've got um, Superintendent uh, Johnson, Wilton Johnson, his wife, and his two children. They're all here today as a deacon at our church in the Testament. We have Deacon Atwell Ferguson. He is here today. First time the Grand Bahama. <laughs> so he said, he got to come. This is the Woodside funeral. We got a commander, uh, senior commander, Freddie Brown, here today. And, and he is here. Where's Freddie? Something about you. Okay, great. Amen. And we appreciate the fact we got, and we got them all. One of the best places you could possibly have. My wife sitting right there. <laughs> It's, it's our joy, it's our privilege to be here. We all came here for one thing, to let you know we love you. We love this family. Somebody asked me, how are you going to preach? I said, I'm going to preach and I'm going to cry and cry and preach. <laughs> they all thought it important to be here today. And so we want to say that. She's a woman of a legacy. She's a woman that is virtuous, that has been said. We want to say this. Young men, do not marry women that are, what the scripture says, whose price is rubies. Marry women. Ah, you got it. Who are prices far above rubies? That's what Sister Woodside wants. A woman who, whose virtue was far above rubies. I tell you, as we think about this and the fact that death is coming, and death has an appointment, as an appointment a man wants to die, I want to say this to you, that's an appointment you will keep. If you're a black person, you will keep that appointment with death. If you're white, you're going to keep the appointment with death. If you're rich, you're going to keep the appointment with death. If you're poor, you will keep that appointment with death. If you're a male, you're going to keep that appointment with death. I mean, some folks don't know what male is. If you're female, you will keep that appointment with death. If you're intelligent, you will keep that appointment with death. If you're ignorant, you will keep that appointment with death. If you're in the Bahamas, you will keep that appointment with death. If you're someplace else, you in Canada and outside of the Caribbean, you will keep that appointment with death. If you're the president of any nation or the prime minister or the governor, you will keep that appointment with death. If you're just a peasant, you will keep that appointment with death. If you're an athlete, you will keep that appointment with death. Hey, listen to me. If you're a slave, you will keep that appointment with death. If you're a slave owner, you will keep an appointment with death. If you're a wife, you will keep a, 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 an appointment with death. If you're a husband, you will keep an appointment with death. If you're a child, you will keep that appointment with death. If you're old, you're going to keep an appointment with death. If you're young, you're going to keep an appointment with death. If you're married, you will keep an appointment with death. If you're single, you will keep an appointment with death. If you're gay, you're going to keep an appointment with death. If you're living straight, you're going to keep an appointment with death. If you're living godly, you will keep an appointment with death. If you're living ungodly, you will keep an appointment with death. If you're in a club, you will keep an appointment with death. If you're in church, you're going to keep an appointment with death. You're not going to escape that. It is appointed under man once to die. No scientific achievement can stop it. None of your technology can prevent it. You will keep that appointment with death. Right, right. One of the things that's interesting is, you know, death strips us of all our titles and said concerning some Austrian funeral that um, uh, this emperor had died. And uh, they put him in the coffin and they carried him to the church and knocked on the door and the monks on the inside said, Who is this? And they said, Emperor John Silili. And uh, the answer came back from inside. There is no one here recognized in that name. And they knocked on the door again. Uh, who's there? Emperor John Seeley. Because they get the casket up. And they said, there's no one uh, recognized by that name. And they knocked on the door again. Who is there? 
John C. Lee opened the door. No titles. No prestige. God definitely is looking for any of that. You will get none of that at death. Now, let me say this to you as we launch into what I, I'm going to speak for you for the next 20, let's see, let's 25 minutes by the grace of God, okay? Four, four questions, actually five, but four for sure. How did mine get here? For me to explain my message and to get us to where we need to get, I need you to understand where mine came from. I believe in creation. Yeah, yeah. Now I know there's some folks, they get real super smart, you know, yeah. they call themselves professors, they go to various universities, and I'm sorry I don't have a mic that I can walk around with because normally I'm not locked in here, alright? And they go to various universities and all of a sudden they get so smart, they believe man came from a monkey and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, thank you. And, and they got this idea in their head that uh, I'm so intelligent now, uh, you know, I can figure it out. Man came from a little amoeba, etc., etc. And you know, you've heard that poem, I once was a tadpole, small and thin. Then I became a monkey with my tail tucked in. Then I became a baboon swinging from a tree. And now I'm a professor with a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> when we talk about creation, where man came from, there's a lot of atheistic foolishness going around. Man is said to come by evolution. Man is an accident and random production of a blind and non-personal series of chemicals and biological events. The evolution continues and says this is the process by which all living organisms have developed from simple to more complex form. You know what? The people who believe that really are Dumb. Where did man come from? I believe man was created by God. Genesis God called man on the dust of the earth. There's a guy that made human. I, I love the illustration. A guy by the name of Ray Comfort gave. Talked about atheism. Here's a film I think he has out. YouTube. Atheist delusion. Take some time to watch it. But he talks about how the real DNA. I mean, think of these people who believe that we. Uh, came as a result of evolution. You think of a book. You see how beautiful this book has been? Do you think that uh, this book, the colors drop out of the sky at random? The words dropped out of the sky at random. The punctuations dropped out of the sky at random. And they all, and the words and the punctuation form perfect sentences at random. Pictures drop at random. Words, the binding of this book just came to be as a result of randomness. Anybody who believes that is a nut. But that's what they're telling us when it comes to evolution. They're against the creation of God. That God, a uh, higher intelligence. Listen, this book was somebody intelligent put this together. And by the way, they did a great job. I don't know who's designed. Great job. Amen. But when you look at man, whose DNA is more, is infinitely more complex than even this book, you have to conclude there's, there's a great designer, a great creator, an intelligent designer, a being beyond us, someone supernatural. Listen to me, you can't convince me that you put a bunch of iron together, throw it on the ground, and all of a sudden a car is going to come out of that. It's going to evolve into a car. Oh. You can't tell me that you throw a bunch of dirt and rocks and stones on the ground and all of a sudden all of that is going to come a building. You can't tell me you take a bunch of wire, put it together, and all of a sudden all of that, all of that is going to come a cell phone. All of these things point to a supernatural, divine, intelligent, wonderful creator. We are creations of God. That's important to understand. They say concerning just the human body. <laughs> the heart, roughly the size of a large fist, weighs about 9 to 12 ounces. It beats 100,000 times a day. It is 60 to 80 times a minute. Uh, it, it pumps uh, 200 gallons of blood per day. It's like a muscle that pumps blood to all parts of the body and provides oxygen and nutrients. The heart. Think about the blood, 60,000 
thousand miles of blood vessels in human. And you're trying to tell me, this all just come, came out of here. Right. This is what the brain said, you know, three billion neurons. That's nerves and else. You know, 60% of the brain is fine. It goes on the storage, the capacity storage for the brain is virtually unlimited and there's much more we can see. And you're going to tell me all this occurred as a result of evolution. No, I'm saying this. I'm going somewhere. Man has been divinely created by God. You are a creation of God. Where did man come from? It came from the hand of God. People who say we evolved and we got here by accident over millions and millions and millions of years, but that's, that's wrong too. They must have been dropped on their head when they were babies. Or maybe a coconut landed on them. Really? I read the Bible where it says, in the beginning, God! Right. You can believe the first four words in the Bible, you can believe the whole book. If you can understand the first five words in the Bible, you can understand the great majority of the Bible. In the beginning, God created it. Hey, that's one question. But here's another question. I said, where did mine come from? The second question is this. And we got four questions. What is mine? What is mine? This creation of God, this unique creation of God, what is mine? Mine is body, mine is soul, and mine is spirit. Look at this. Man is body. Genesis 2 1. That's what the body was made out of the dust of the earth. Through, through the body, we get what is called world consciousness. World consciousness is expressed through the body, the bones, the blood, the tissue, the skin. Through the soul, we have what is called self consciousness, where we experience the pain and pleasure and joy and happiness. When God blew into that body, man became a living soul. Jesus said, it, he said something that's very powerful in Mark 8, 36. What shall it profit a man if he gave a whole world and lose his soul? And so we see man's body, man's body made from the dust. Man is a soul. And then we see man is a spirit. In Acts chapter 7, verse 59, when Stephen was about to expire, he said, Lord Jesus, we calling upon God, by the way, Acts 7, 59, Stephen was about to die, and he was calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Right. Yeah. So what is man? I believe that man is a soul that lives in a body and it has a spirit. I've never seen you, you've never seen me. You, we only see the house that we live in. Yeah. I've seen Sister Woodside house, and then I've seen the actions, the attitudes of her soul because of the things she has done, the people she has served, her tenacity. And by the way, don't think Sister Woodside used to sit down and just let anything go. She knew how to speak up. And if it ain't right, she'll tell you it ain't right. All right, that's all the amen I get. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, man, I believe, is a soul that lives in a body called his house, and he has the spirit. You know, we are distinct from animals. Animals were not made in the image of God. Only man was. I don't have time to go through all of it and show you all the verses. But you can turn to Genesis 1, 26 through 28, when you get the chance. We are alone of all creation have been made in the image of God. That's right. Only man. Now that image is not physical. But I certainly believe it is intelligence and logic and we have complex reasoning. We can do that. We can describe of all the creatures God created. We can even describe our own thoughts. No other creatures can do that. In the image of God refers to our capacity to interact with God. In the image of God it refers to our morality ability. We have a moral, moral capacity. No other creature has that. In the image of God means that we can communicate and control our environment. Man 
is made in the image of God. In the image of God being he him, male and female. How is man gave up? Creation of God. Second question, what is man? Man is a soul that lives in a body and has a spirit. He only, he alone is the only creature that is made in the image, intellectual, interacting, understanding morality of God. Third question, what is death? We talked about what is man, where man came from, the hand of God. We talked about what is man, soul that lives in the body. Now let's talk about what is death. First Corinthians 15 21 says, Death is an enemy. And he's the last enemy to be destroyed. That's what scripture says. First Corinthians 15 21. The last enemy. Huh. I wish that fellow had been gone already. Now there are at least seven kinds of death in scripture, but we won't go through that and give you three aspects that I want you to think on that relate to what we're saying. Spiritual death. In the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned, and Adam was the main one responsible, we were all responsible, but when God came in the garden, he didn't say, Adam and Eve, where is thou? He said, What? Adam! Where is thou? Where are you? Let me tell you something when you get married, the man is responsible. Amen. Amen. Oh, amen. So, I need something. I don't know what's going on. Well, Pastor, what's I know? I can just preach anyway. 